All right, everybody settled in. Well, wow, could you ever hear me? Yeah, good, 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 good. All right, I'm Lee Thompson. I'm one of the uh, organizers for the event. Uh, you can tell your organizers by the gray shirts with the DevOps Day logo. Any questions? You know, what's going to happen? What's going to be fun? Grab one of us. Um, when we, if one of these uh, sides ends early, there will be some crosstalk. Uh, try to be quiet and move up conversations on the outside. That way, we, you know, the other uh, presentation can go. I do want to say uh, it's great to be uh, kicking off the culture side. Uh, this is Daryl K. Royal Stadium. Uh, very instrumental guy in this community in Austin, Texas, and, and kind of the culture he established. Very, very conservative guy. Uh, if you don't agree with conservative politics, uh, he, he changed a lot of why Austin is what Austin is. Uh, one of his favorite things in the world was listening to Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson was not a conservative guy, and he brought Willie Nelson to the city. And there was a really good article about two weeks ago that proved that Austin's culture was pretty much derived off of Willie Nelson, including the technology culture. Uh, so uh, a very hardcore conservative guy with a very hardcore uh, liberal guy getting together and making this community back when Austin was very small. Um, and so culture is really important. I think uh, the older I get, the more I appreciate, you know, good cultures and companies as you go through and bad cultures. And I've been in both. And your day is so much more productive when you have a good culture. Uh, we have Dave, uh, Dave Mango, kicking us off. Dave is a longtime contributor to DevOps Day. I met Dave five years ago at a Dev DevOps event. Um, he's from San Francisco. I love it when we get people flying in to help this conference out. Uh, with content like Dave, very strong DevOps guy. And let's hand it over and see what Dave has to say to us. Thank you, sir. Everybody can hear me OK. Hopefully, you can see the slides. Um, so good morning. Uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, come and participate in the DevOps Days Austin community. Um, my company that I work for, SolarWinds, uh, is based here in Austin. So I've been here a bunch of times. And it's always super fun to come back to Austin because the DevOps community here is really amazing. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the cognitive neuroscience of empathy. So it says you're a DevOps natural. So why, why do we say you're a DevOps natural? That's kind of weird. We're at a DevOps conference. Are we all DevOps naturals? Um, you know what the weird thing is here? My speaker notes are not up. Sorry. I have a feeling I am mirroring. Sorry about that. Ah, uh, much better. Thank you. OK. Um, so the idea I want you to have when you walk away from this talk is that this ability to empathize, which is a core part of DevOps, is built into you. So when you get to a situation when you're like, oh, man, I don't want to go talk to the network engineers, like I want you to think back to this talk and remember like the ability to do all this kind of stuff is a core part of who we are as a human. So for me, my background, um, I got a degree in what's called cognitive science. So uh, that was sort of cognitive neuropsychology and computer science. And I was lucky enough after school to get a job at NIH uh, in Bethesda, Maryland doing research. And one of the things that I did aside from C programming a lot was um, I got to participate in one of these brand new fields that was just developing called functional magnetic resonance. And the idea behind functional magnetic resonance is we take people, we put them in an MRI machine, and we scan them, and we look for where the blood is flowing in their brain. And so when our brain areas are active, they need a couple things. They need oxygen, and they need glucose, because that's, those are the neurons that are firing. So if we look to where the blood is flowing, we can actually see which parts of the brain are active, because they're consuming resources. So a lot of the talks or a lot of the papers and a lot of the studies that we're going to talk about today are based on this idea of functional magnetic resonance, which has turned into a 
very common research technique. Um, and also as a result of that, uh, any pictures that you see of brains inside this talk, that's my brain. Uh, I kept the data from when I used to do this. Um, so the other thing we're going to talk about is this is science, right? And science changes all the time. They say in science that science advances one funeral at a time as like old ideas die off and new people come up and they have new ideas. So things might change. You might walk up to me and say like, hey, you know that thing that you presented three years ago at DevOps Days Austin? Like, turns out that study has like been disproven. Like, that's okay. Like, this is sort of like what we have at the time. But also since this idea of empathy and things like that are part of an emerging field, then like some of the things we might talk about might sound a little conflicting or there might be multiple definitions or stuff like that because this is sort of an advancing field. So the brain, like kind of a cool thing that people have studied all for eternity basically trying to understand things. One of the interesting things about when people have been studying the brain is they always try to explain the brain in whatever like the most advanced thing that they have at the time is. So back when the clocks were like the most technologically advanced cool thing, everyone used to describe the brain the way it operated as like a clock. Or nowadays everyone's like, oh, the brain's just like a computer. But you no, know, the brain's not really like a computer. It, but it's also not like one big mess. So we know that different parts of the brain are actually responsible for very specific things. And so unlike this, you know, phrenology thing, like these things are probably not really where stuff is located. But we do know a lot more nowadays about where things are located. When I was working at NIH, I worked with this Dr. Mark Mentis, brilliant guy, psychiatrist. Uh, and he was doing his residency in South Africa. And he got a phone call one night from the emergency room that he needed to come in because somebody had tried to take their own life with a gun and he needed to come in and deal with it. So he shows up at the emergency room and he's looking around and he's looking for somebody on a gurney. There's nobody. There's nobody like that looks like they need any help from a doctor. And so he goes up to the nurse and he's like, where is my patient? Like I got called in that there's you know somebody uh, who I need to come in and take care of. And they're like, oh, it's, it's that guy over there. And there's a guy standing up in the corner of the emergency room and he's got a crowd of doctors and nurses around him and they're laughing their heads up. Well, they're laughing like crazy. And, uh, and he's like, what's going on? Well, it turns out that this guy, when he had tried to commit suicide, had damaged his frontal lobe. And part of what your frontal lobes do is they inhibit you saying inappropriate things in places that would be inappropriate to say those things. Well, this guy didn't have any kind of sense of that anymore, so he was telling really, really disgusting jokes, which I guess were hilarious, but like he just had no concept of this because like this part of his brain had been damaged. And so scientists have often looked into parts of the brain and what they do. So there is a laboratory in Parma, Italy. So that's Parmesan cheese on the slide to help you remember. That's your mnemonic. Um, <laughs> And it's the early 90s, and there's a scientist, Vittorio Galesi, is in this lab, and he's studying the macaque monkey. And he's studying an area of the brain, and the monkey's called F5, and us it's called like the premotor area. And he's got um, electrodes implanted in this monkey's brain, and you know, he's a very experienced neuroscientist, uh, and he's taking recordings of what's going on. And so there's a time where he's not doing any experiments, and he's in the lab with a monkey, and Vittorio reaches for a piece of fruit, as the story goes, and he hears this familiar sound of a neuron firing. Well, this doesn't make any sense, because when the monkey's reaching for something, we're supposed to hear this neuron firing. When the monkey's watching Vittorio reach for a piece of fruit, why is this neuron firing? Like, that's really strange. And so what this was was the discovery of what we call mirror neurons. And mirror neurons are neurons that are specially designed in our heads uh, so that not only when we do something do these neurons fire, but when we witness somebody else or we see someone else do these things, the neurons fire as well. And so this idea is, is that when we see something in someone else, we actually experience that in ourselves is crucial to this idea of empathy. And mirror neurons are really interesting because they're not just for things like reaching. They're for things like grasping. They're for things like tearing. 
And they're not just like gross motor movement either. They're for things like visual and auditory things. We have mirror neurons for all of this stuff. And this is stuff that we're born with, right? Like grasping is something that we can learn, but imitation happens even in babies. Like most parents know, if you stick your tongue out at a baby, the baby's gonna stick their tongue out back at you. Like this connection that we have, that we naturally build, like a, a social system between two entities is wired into who we are. That's just how we're made. And scientists call this the default network. And the default network is what our brain is doing all the time, trying to figure out the world, trying to understand what's happening. So some of you may recognize Andrew Schaefer. I put his picture on the screen. But what's happening when I put this picture up? Well, I probably activated mirror neurons in lots of people in the room and probably activated the default network. Because when you look at Andrew, you're trying to figure out, like, what are his emotions? Like, how do you know what those things are? Like, what's he thinking? How do you know what those things are? Our brains are naturally wired to connect. This default network spends its time trying to figure out what other people are doing whenever it's not doing anything else. That's why we call it the default network. So why, why does our brain do this? Like, why did we have, why does evolution and all this other stuff, why would they create this default network where we're trying to figure out other people? Well, think about it this way. If I'm a group of monkeys and I'm sitting around with my monkey friends and a tiger comes at night to try to take one of the monkeys and I'm like, well, it's not me, it's this other mon ti monkey, so the tiger takes him away. After a few nights, there ain't gonna be any monkeys left, right? So our brain is naturally trying to connect with other people because we need to ensure the survival of the group. If the monkey comes at night and all, or the tiger comes at night and all the monkeys get together and they fight off the tiger, we're actually ensuring our own survival. So our brain is wired to try to make these connections with other people because we want to survive. This desire, this drive in our brain to connect with other people is so intense that it actually manifests itself in really strange ways. So they did these experiments in the 1940s and 1950s and they showed people these videos of these shapes moving around on a screen, right? And there's a triangle and there's a circle and they asked people to describe what's going on and people are like, oh, that, that big mean triangle, like why doesn't he leave the other triangle alone? They ascribe intention to paper shapes that are moving around on a screen. They anthropomorphize these shapes because our brains are looking to explain what's going on. Our brains are always trying to connect with other people and trying to make uh, some kind of a connection. And this slide is so funny because everybody wants to see the end. <laughs> so I will post it later. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so here's a quote from Matthew Lieberman and I will let you uh, read it. And this is sort of where we're really closing in on our idea of empathy. everyone's had a chance to read it. So we have this model of empathy, and this is uh, a model that's being advanced by uh, people at UCLA, Stanford, Harvard. Uh, now that Sylvia Morelli went to University of Chicago, she's pushing it there. But it's this three kind of component model of empathy. And this, the mirror neurons that we were talking about earlier are only one component of this model. So that's this experience sharing uh, that we have on the very top. And other, there's other names for this experience sharing. There's emotional contagion, there's shared feelings, there's stuff like that. But it's this idea that like we actually have a representation in our brain when we witness something in somebody else that is something that we're actually experiencing like this stuff internally. Another part of the empathy model is this idea of pro-social concern uh, or empathic concern or something like that. And this is the idea that we form a goal to alleviate others' suffering. So it's not enough in empathy to just witness some, what somebody else is going through and being like, well, that sucks for them. That's not empathy. Even if we're like, oh, wow, that, they probably are really upset by that. Like, unless we're motivated to do something about it, you know, that's, not, that's not the complete part of the model. If you know, the ops 
team is up late at night and the dev team comes in the next day and they're like, well, sorry that you guys had to deal with that. Like, that's not empathy. There's no, there's no bridge that's being built there. And the third component of the model is this idea of mentalizing um, or mindfulness. And I love this part. It's super fascinating to me. But it's this idea that we can recognize a mind in other people. We recognize that other people are like cognitive beings that actually are thinking things. Because if we don't recognize basically that humanity in other people, we're not going to be able to have this idea of empathy. So this idea of, um, of mentalizing is really fascinating. And so the scientist Lear Hackle says, when we empathize with someone, we must first detect a mind that can feel pain. So they did the, these experiments uh, called the Sally Ann test, or also called the false belief paradigm. And they're looking for this idea of mentalizing. And so what happens in this test is the subject sits down and they watch like a little puppet show. And there's Sally and there's Ann and they're best friends and they like to do all kinds of things together and it's super fun. And at some point, Sally decides that she's gonna go for a walk. So Sally and Ann had been playing with a ball or a marble or something like that. And Sally takes the marble before she leaves for her walk and she puts it in her little box that's on the stage and she leaves. And she goes for her little walk, and as soon as she leaves, Anne goes over and takes the ball out of her, out of Sally's box, and puts it in Anne's box. And then when Sally's done with her walk, she comes back, and they ask the subject, well, where is Sally going to look for the ball? Now, most of us would probably say, well, Sally's going to look in Sally's box for the ball. But it turns out that if you have autism or you're under the age of four, you're actually going to say that. Sally's going to look in, or sorry, most of us would say that Sally would look in Sally's box. Maybe I got it right the first time. Anyways, um, if you're under the age of four, if you have autism, you're going to say that Sally is going to look in Anne's box because you don't have the ability to distinguish between what you're experiencing and what Sally's experiencing. You don't recognize there's a distinction between yourself and this character, Sally, that you're watching, you don't recognize that she can have a distinct brain, a, a distinct mind of her own. So it's kind of like fascinating, this idea of, um, of this mindfulness, of understanding that somebody else has a mind, because this like ability to attribute mindfulness to another person always reminds me of one of our favorite cognitive biases that we talk about in DevOps all the time. Fundamental attribution error. Does everybody remember what that is? Okay. So for people who don't remember, the fundamental attribution error is this idea that like, if somebody does something bad, if it's me, the reason I'm doing it, something bad is because I didn't have enough coffee, or Lee messed up my intro, or somebody you know bumped into my car, or whatever. I have some reason, the situational why I did something bad. If somebody else does something bad, it's because that's who they are. They're a jerk. They did this. They're like this. That's who they are. We attribute this. Um, <clears throat> we attribute this. These intentional stances to other people because our default network in our brain adopts an intentional stance. So we engage this area of our brain called the medial prefrontal cortex, which we'll talk about more in a second, because we attribute mindfulness to the error. We say it's part of someone else's fundamental disposition for them to be acting like that as opposed to it just being something that's situational. So these are some parts of the default network. So yes, that is my brain. Um, probably, since it's so long ago, it probably doesn't look as good as it did back then. Um, but uh, there are some parts of the default network that are missing up here, like the temporal parietal junction. But this medial prefrontal cortex is um, really a big part of what we're, gonna, of what we're talking about. Um, and so all these things about empathy are great. I've got this three-tier, three-component model and stuff like that. But how does that apply to, you know, Ernest said downstairs, he's like, well, if culture is all about, you know, just like dev and ops going out and having beers together, like, that's not really actionable. It doesn't really do a whole lot for me. So what do we know about, um, about uh, the empathy? And what do we know about it uh, when we're talking about teams? Because I work on a team. I don't just like walk around and try to empathize with people. Well, we know a couple of things. We know that we mentalize about groups, so we attribute mindfulness to groups in the same way that we mentalize about individuals. 
So now when I'm thinking about the ops team or I'm thinking about the network engineering team, I attribute mindfulness to that group. We know that out of group members evoke less activation in the medial prefrontal cortex. So we actually empathize less with people that we consider in an out group as opposed to an in group, people that are, are close to us. There is a lower threshold to mind perception, to this idea of mentalizing, for in group members. The only time that we consider this, we have a low threshold to mentalizing about out group members is if we consider them a threat. So if someone's coming at you with a knife, you are pretty sure that they intend to come at you with a knife. They're not just like random zombie people. So you can attribute mindfulness to people if they're in an out group as long as you consider them a threat. <clears throat> and this is why silos are bad, right? We're talking about in groups and out groups. If I have a lower threshold of mind perception for my in groups, if I find it harder to mentalize about out groups, then what does that mean when I'm on the operations team and the network engineering team is doing something different? It's a lot harder to be able to make those connections with the other team. So team, right? So how do we get teams to work together? <laughs> so getting teams to work together is a challenge, right? But scientists have been studying this for a long time. Um, and there's a theory that's been going around for about the past 15 years called the common in-group identity model. Um, Gertner and DeVideo are, are advancing this about how teams can best work together. And a core component of this model is what's called the contact hypothesis. And the contact hypothesis specifies that contact with outgroup members is beneficial to attitudes about the outgroup. So we work better with people in the outgroup when certain criteria are in place. The first is they need to have equal status. So if we have two teams that are working with each other that don't have equal status, that's going to inhibit the ability to build these bridges, to build these in-group kind of roads between them. They have to have common goals. Does this sound like DevOps to anybody? Gene Kim's first way, right? We're optimizing the system as a whole. We're doing systems thinking. We have to have common goals. There's no point in doing some kind of local optimization. We have to actually all be working on the same problem. We have to be in a cooperative or interdependent setting. Again, like we're trying to optimize our system, right? We're doing what's best for our customer and for our team members and stuff like that in DevOps. And we also have to have support from authorities, which, you know, in this group, I say we would have support from management. So these are the components, like common goals, cooperative settings, equal status, and support from management. These are the things that will allow teams to work together. If you go back to your organization on Wednesday and you, you don't see these things, then you're not in the best situation that you can be in order to succeed and have these uh, connections between teams and be able to break down the barriers in between the teams. So what can we do about it? I mean, these are, these are interesting things to talk about on a group level, but let's take it down one more step a little bit. Let's talk about it on an individual level. So this quote from Jonathan Swift, it's useless to attempt to reason a man out of a thing he was never reasoned into. So we need to show people how we're the same. We can't reason people into this idea. We can't just go up and spout a bunch of stuff uh, and explain it to people in order to get them to understand. So some people would call this like winning hearts, not minds, right? So I used to work with this guy named Walter. I've actually worked with him um, at a couple of different companies. And I went to Walter and I was like, hey, I want your team to be involved in this DevOps conference that we're going to put on at this company that, that we work at together. And Walter was like, yeah, I don't know. I've heard a bunch of things about DevOps. It sounds kind of interesting. But I got to tell you, Dave, like I've heard some really strange things about DevOps. Like one of the things that I've heard is like the developers have to carry pagers. And you know, I have to sell this to the people on my team. And I was like, yeah, OK. And he's like, well, I got to tell you, like, people on my team, they don't want to get woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I said, Walter, people on my team don't want to get woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning either. He's like, oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> I get it. All right, we'll be at your conference. And, we'll, you know, and they came and they participated. But like, I had to show Walter like, how we were the same. right? I had to appeal to his sense of empathy for him to really understand, I didn't go say like, 
hey, Walter, pre, you know, medial prefrontal cortex, stuff like that. Like, that's not like the way to, <laughs> to convince him. Like, we have to show him like what's common between our two groups. And these feelings that we can create in other people when we do this kind of, of uh, you know, outreach, for lack of a better word, are real. Like, these are actually like real things that people experience in their, in their head. And so, um, we're going to talk a little bit about pain. And um, I don't know, but it's just when scientists are doing studies uh, and they want to evoke like emotions in people, it's really hard to get someone in like a functional magnetic resonance scanner to like laugh or be happy or whatever. But if you shock somebody with electric shock, like that's real. Like you can, that actually shows up pretty well in the, in the studies and stuff. So they've done a lot of studies about pain. Uh, and brain mapper Tanya Singer did this great experiment where she was trying to like examine this idea of like mirror neurons that we talked about, but examine it from this uh, idea of, of humans and using functional magnetic resonance. And what she did is she put women in a scanner and she had their boyfriends outside the scanner and the women could see the boyfriends. I don't know if anyone's ever been in an MRI machine, but they probably had some kind of crazy mirror system or something like that so they could see them. And they did scans on these uh, people, on these women while they were in the scanners. Now during the experiment, they administered electric shock. But they administered electric shocks either to the women in the scanner or to the boyfriends. The strangest part about doing this was when they administered the shocks, no matter who was getting shocked, these women had activation in their pain distress network and their dorsal anterior cingular cortex and their interior insula. Whether they were the ones who were getting the shock or that they saw their boyfriends getting the electric shock. Like these women could say to their boyfriends with a straight face, I feel your pain. <laughs> and so these feelings like are, are real. Like the things that we're talking about, these aren't just like, you know, whatever, like, oh, well this is something that you just experience in your brain. Like these are actually real feelings. They did another experiment, not Tanya Singer, but another lab, which was called Cyberball. In Cyberball, they take somebody and they put them in the scanner, and they say, you're going to co cooperate and collaborate with people in two other scanners in other parts of the world, which is a total lie, but whatever. Uh, and they said, we're going to look at how you cooperate and collaborate with these other people, and we're going to scan your brain while you do this. And so as the study goes on, the three people in the scanner are tossing a ball back and forth. And at one point, the two cohorts, the people who are not being studied, uh, stop tossing the ball to the person that's in the scanner. And the person that's in the scanner actually feels rejection. And when they interview these people afterwards, they're like, you know, how'd you feel? And they actually activated the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. Like, they actually activated pain receptors in their brain as if they've been getting like electric shock, right? It's the same thing. And the, the weirdest part about how real this stuff is, about how real these pain feelings are, is they did these cyberball experiments with two groups. They did one who was like the regular group, and they did one with people who were on painkillers, like uh, Tylenol or something like that. The people who were on Tylenol had reduced activation in their dorsal anterior cingulate cortex during the cyberball experiment. The same kinds of feelings of pain and stuff that we feel like during our regular day are, are real things that we can experience when we're interacting with other people, when we're interacting with other groups. And so we can turn it around from stuff about pain to things that are positive. And so Matthew Lieberman gave us that quote before. He says, positive social regard is a renewable resource. Rather than having less of something after using it, when we let others know that we value them, both parties have more. So what do we need to do? We need to give out praise more. We need to activate those opioid and dopaminergic receptors that are in our brain because it's really cheap and really easy for us to do, but it's real. Like when we actually give positive reinforcement to, to people on our teams, that's activating real things in, inside people's brains that are motivating. So making connections to other people is something that we said that you have to do, right? And you have to be able to appeal to people's, you know, empathy and things like that. But um, what about chat ops, right? We're, we're talking with people who we've maybe never met before. And, you know, I love Slack. 
you can ask the people who are here for my team that you know we're on Slack every day, all the time, all day, whether we're sleeping or not. Um, and so, what do we do about that? Well, there's this uh, there's a model of empathy called the perception action uh, model, and it says that empathy increases with both familiarity and similarity. So the next time somebody in your uh, company is like, well, I don't know if we should get the remote people together uh, who are you know, working with our teams, this is really important. We need to get those people together. We need to have them together for an onsite because in order to build these in-group ideas between people, we need to use all the modalities that we can. So go multimodal, right? If you're going to have meetings with people, you want to activate those mirror neurons that we're talking about. You want to have this experience sharing. You want to use every different component, auditory, visual, things like that, to be able to build the most amount of emotional contagion between us and the other people. Um, they say, like, perceivers want to be evaluated positively by others, and the presence of another surveilling mind can therefore increase socially desirable behavior. So if I'm on Slack and I'm just typing things and I don't feel like anyone's really paying attention to what I'm doing, I'm going to have a much different experience building those relationships with other people than I am if we turn on the webcam and we start talking to people on the other side. So we talked about group dynamics. We talked about how team people work across big groups. We talked about team dynamics. We talked about how we interact with other teams. So the last slide is we're going to talk about individuals. We can talk about individual dynamics. And so we don't necessarily want to drive experience sharing across teams uh, for empathy because if the ops team is up all night and they're super grumpy, the idea isn't that like the dev team is super grumpy the next day. Like everybody being super grumpy the next day isn't really like what we're going for. What we want to drive as much as possible is that idea of pro-social concern of like caring about what other people are doing and wanting to help alleviate that. So that if the ops team is up all night, the developers are like, I need to get my code better. I need to do this. I need to build more resiliency. I need to do whatever I can to help these people. And so we want to create more in-groups. So we know a couple of things that are really interesting. The emotional contagion of pain in humans occurs in friends, but not in strangers. Seems rather obvious, right? We feel things more towards people who we're closer with. We actually have that mirror kind of idea more likely with them. Stress reduction in humans can elicit emotional contagion of pain in strangers. So if we reduce stress in people, they're more likely to be able to empathize. Decisions directly after stress revealed increased generosity towards socially close but not distant others. So if we're stressed out, we're more likely to be kind of huddled into our little group than we are to be working with other people. So this suggests that stress is a key to emotional contagion, which is one of the fundamental building blocks of empathy. So I don't know how many people have been following what John Willis has been talking about a lot lately with burnout and things like that. But the kind of the key idea here is that we need to take care of ourselves because Burnout inhibits empathy. And if burnout inhibits empathy, then burnout inhibits DevOps. So we need to do whatever we can to take care of ourselves to make sure that we're working with our teams to put everybody in a good situation. When we take care of ourselves, that enables us to start having empathy for people in our in-group. When we take care of our in-group, that enables us to have empathy towards people in our out-group. And this is kind of a Zen idea, they call it loving kindness, but like spreading this idea of like radiating out from where we are to other areas, to far flung parts of the organization. So I'm asking you to take care of yourself, take care of your uh, fellow teammates, take care of other people in your company, uh, and really enable the building of in-groups as opposed to out-groups, which will enable you to be much better at DevOps. And that's it. I have some thank yous for people who have helped me with this. There's a selected bibliography, which when I post it, there's lots of really good stuff in here. Um, if you want to dig in like crazy, there's tons of papers that you can read uh, about this stuff. And 
I might have like a few minutes for questions. Yeah. Otherwise, you can hit me up on Twitter or find me during the conference. You got them now. Any questions? The Dunbar limit. So this is 150. Dunbar's number. So Dunbar's number as I know it, the 150 is like the kind of maximum social group that you can maintain. Um, that's actually based on the thickness of our uh, neocortex. So he kind of examined like the social groups from like different like species and then looked at the size of their cortex and then extrapolated out like from that like what your sort of maximum number is. And so um, I think the interesting thing about that is like that's the number that you have for yourself, like 150 people. So if you have 150 people doing that, then there's a lot of ability to radiate out like this kind of idea to other people. Um, well, they're not the exact same neurons because you're not sharing the same brain. But uh, yeah, I mean, they're going to be generally in the same area, right? There's a certain amount of neuroplasticity where um, the networks that you build in your brain to build something like that aren't going to be a one-to-one -one thing. Uh, one of my favorite things at work at NIH was like somebody gave me an, an explanation of deja vu, which is like a, you know, everyone knows what this is. Um, so she said that in deja vu, the idea that scientists had in their, their, in their brains was like, I build neural networks that represent something. So I represent an idea, that's a, that's a pattern of activation in my brain. And she said that uh, she felt like deja vu was a partial activation of an entire network. And so if I have enough neurons in that, uh, that match that pattern, then my brain will kind of fill in the rest. And that's why I have the feeling that I've seen this thing before, is because I recognize like this pattern of activation. But, um, you're going to have similar patterns of activation. It'll just be how your brain kind of wired those things up. Okay, one more. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, I would say that if someone is sort of acting badly towards somebody else, then they're not they, well, for me, I, I would say they don't have like this ability to mentalize about other people very well. I mean, in some of these papers, if you go look at like psychopaths, psychopaths have no ability to do certain parts of this mental model. Like it's just not in their, I'm not saying that the people in your organization who are acting bad are psychopaths, <laughs> but, <laughs> but. Sociopathy is, yeah, I mean, all this stuff is learned. Uh, you know, mirror neurons are not learned, but certainly the idea of pro-social concern and mentalizing, I think, are things that we can work on and, and build. And so if someone's not setting an example that, you know, allows for that kind of uh, connection, then that could be a problem. Thank you so much, Dave. And, and a quick, quick announcement. Don't leave your bags in here because this room does close at 1230. And lunch will be back over in the rest in the afternoon. Everything is back at the Sunshine Club on the north side of the stadium. So don't leave anything in this room because it will get locked up. And, uh, Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it.